Okay, welcome to this lecture on invasive species. This is the course Bio 340 Conservation Biology. I am Dr. Jess Stratford from Wilkes University. Let's start the uh, lecture with a number of definitions. So one definition I think we went over with previously is endemic. So species that are endemic involved and are native to a particular area. When you take those individuals and those species and move them to a new place, they become introduced or alien or exotic. And those are more or less um, synonyms. Uh, invasive means that the species no longer needs our help to get around. So um, gypsy moths are an invasive species. So they were released into the US and they're considered invasive because we no longer, I hope, are releasing gypsy moth in mass to keep the population going. They, they do that themselves. And established means that the population is widespread and the population is really neither increasing or decreasing. It's, it's uh, more, or less, more or less stable. Okay, to give you some idea of the extent of the number of invasive species within the US, there have been 50,000 introduced species. Okay, most of these are invertebrates. Uh, there have been many, many, many that are vertebrates, house sparrows, starlings, rats, cats, goats, pigs. Uh, but most of these 50,000 species are actually minute. That's not to say they're not important. We'll get to that later. Uh, in many islands, there are more um, introduced species of birds and insects than there are native species. And just to give you a focus in on one place, California has over a thousand invasive species. Uh, that statistic is about 10 years old, so it's probably closer to 2000 species. And the number of species, invasive species is rapidly increasing. So we'll see at the very end of this lecture that we're trying to slow down invasive species, but actually the number of species are getting established in the US is increasing exponentially. Now let me bring up one more thing with this graph. This graph, if you notice, starts at the year 1850 that really starts the industrial revolution. And what happened with that is you get um, large international travel and commerce. And with ships moving around, they also brought invasive species. So that's when things really take off. And we also had much better records of uh, what animals and plants were in areas. So who, who are the good invaders? What makes a species good at being an invasive species? Species are often in so associated with disturbance. So these are places where um, there may have been a house, the house burns down, the area is bulldozed, you have a brown field. Uh, invasive species are often the species you see coloni colonizing a brown field. Uh, roadsides are very disturbed, so snow plows, and uh, you may get uh, tree companies come in and remove trees, then other trees are allowed to move in in shrubs. And these are often, very often invasive species. The invasive species may not have uh, predators or diseases that affect them. So if you wanna think about uh, one advantage that introduced species have is they're put into an area. So they're escaping their predators and diseases. So for example, some synanthropic species, species that are associated with humans uh, can live in houses or on houses and they may not have any native species that 
are able to get inside your house and eat those things. Uh, many invasive species have been, you know, not just introduced once, but have had several rounds of introductions. And uh, that helps them overcome what we call ali effects. And ali effects, when it comes to invasive species, means I can release a, uh, a plant that might actually do well, but because a random chance, it may not actually succeed. But if I keep introducing that plant, it will eventually get a catch and uh, catch hold in and then be able to become established. Invasive species often come from areas with a similar climate. And if you look at the US, um, Northern, well, let's just say the Northeast US. So we're on Pennsylvania, the Mid Atlantic. Um, our invasive species come from areas with a similar climate. So Northern China and uh, Japan has uh, very similar climates to us. And uh, I'm often amazed at the number of uh, scientific names that have sinensis, which means from China, or, Jap or Japonica, which means Japanese. Um, overall, most invasive species are R-selected, not all. And if you remember what our selected species are, these are species that mature early. Uh, they don't invest a lot into um, their immune system. Instead, everything's put into reproduction. They tend to have uh, not large offspring, but many small. So you can have a few large offspring or many few. Most invasive species have many, many small offspring. Um, and they often don't give parental care. Okay. So sort of classic uh, R selected species. And that can also include, uh, they tend to have shorter lives. And again, that's because they're putting everything into reproduction. What are the economic costs of invasive species? This is an underestimate uh, currently because this is from 2005. Um, but invasive species in the U.S. cost our country $120 billion every year. $120 billion every year. So this includes things like property damage. There's a number of invasive termites, agricultural loss. So there's lots of, ter oh, excuse me, lots of insects invasive insects that affect our crops, uh, pest control in homes. So if you think about uh, what invades homes and our need to control them, and this in includes things like the German cockroach, okay? Um, mice, rats, you know, all the little critters that live inside your home that don't belong here. Uh, we control, so this includes both in an agriculture setting and around your home. And then uh, a lot of money is spent on infrastructure damage. So uh, we, there's a number of aquatic plants that clog up waterways. And then things like zebra mussels um, will cover um, equipment that's that's in the water and actually clog up. Uh, waterways as well. If we look at um, some of the impacts of invasive species, 42%, this is going to be an underestimate, 42% uh, of threatened and endangered species are related to invasive species. So um, globally, this is the same trend. And invasive species is considered to be the second uh, most important cause of uh, endangerment next to habitat loss. Um, and then if we look at where uh, invasive organisms have the, the most impact, it really is a global issue, but most importantly on islands. Okay, how do invasive species get around? Sometimes it's intentional. 
So some of the established species have been put here intentionally. There are acclimatization um, societies and what they do is they wanted to get people to move say from uh, England to Australia and so what they did is they went around and planted a lot of species from England and Australia. They did this in the US as well. And the idea was to make people feel at home. So not just the for like landscaping purposes around your house, but also as food sources. So things like dandelions were planted because they're important food source that people were familiar with. Uh, Shakespeare enthusiasts, so uh, there was um, at least one person, might have been a group of people, that wanted to introduce Shakespeare's birds all around the world. And I know in the U.S. they did things like they released house sparrows and starlings uh, intentionally. Game management has introduced some uh, invasive species in the past. Okay. And then wildlife management. And what I mean by that is wildlife management has introduced um, some uh, animals to help control things. So I know um, they've introduced some plants and they've introduced some game. Um, and we'll get to some of those. Ballast water, so what ballast water is, if you take a large cargo ship and you load it up with product, it's going to weigh it down. And when you uh, unload it, your ship's going to go up too high. And so what you do is you take on water to get it at that level that you need it to be. And uh, you can take it back, say, to a place, and then you dump out your ballast water. And what you're really doing is you took in all these say larval forms of say invasive mollusks and fish and then you get to a new place and then you dump out your ballast water when you go to take on product and you're introducing uh seeds and uh, mollusks and and uh say diatoms and algae invasive algae agricultural products um are another way that animals get around you can have escapees, and what I mean by escapees is you can have plants that uh, look good at, as landscaping, and you plant it around your yard, and all of a sudden it's starting to take off. So uh, one that comes to mind is that uh, butterfly bush. This is not butterfly weed, the native that's orange. This is butterfly bush with the blue purple flower. Uh, looks really good around your yard, but in some habitats, it really takes off and becomes invasive that way. Hitchhikers would be when you go to a landscaping place and get your potted plants, uh, there may be animals on the plants or in the soil. So they're, they're not the thing you're buying, but it's the thing you are getting, right? So there's hitchhikers often come... Um, with agricultural products, if they're not pre-treated, and even some food items can, um, when we get shipments in of say bananas and avocados, they can have things that are hitchhiking along for the ride. Um, accidents. So uh, there are things that, um, that accidentally get loose. And I know there are things like after tornadoes and hurricanes in the southeast, um, hurricanes can hit uh, pet stores, blow the roof off, and actually uh, many of the animals will spill out into the environment. Okay. Um, and the last thing I'll say is ignorance. And what I mean by that is people will intentionally introduce an organism into the environment not with the intention of that species uh, taking over the environment what they're thinking of is that their turtle their lizard um, 
um, they don't they don't want to take care of it anymore and they let it go they're boa constrictor and so they let it go and uh, not realizing that they are uh, causing the uh, introduction of uh, an invasive species and a recent one that I can think of is snakehead uh, the snakehead fish is that people were releasing it to to fish for it later and uh, of course you don't catch every fish you fish for and now it's an invasive species in in the mid-atlantic okay. to continue on with the theme of sort of the impacts of invasive species on the environment uh, we know that um, they affect threatened and endangered species and are the cause of threatened and endangered species. And I'm going to go through uh, how, okay? So they can be predators. Uh, there are a number of nest predators that are invasive species. So things like rats, okay? Many of these invasive species are generalists. So they'll just eat anything. And I have here a cat, right? Your cat brings home bats, mice, birds, whatever. It's a generalist uh, mesopredator. And we know, for example, that these uh, things like rats and cats have caused extinction of a few birds, okay, unfortunately. And these things are a big problem uh, on islands. In addition to rats and cats, uh, pigs and goats. And pigs... Um, it's sort of a double whammy because they're both predatory and they modify the habitat. And we'll get to that. Um, so one invasive predator that's kind of new, newish on the scene is uh, you have invasive pythons in Florida and the Everglades. Okay, these many of these species are uh, native to Asia. And they were released into the Everglades and the Everglades is just fine. And there they eat um, many uh, species of native wildlife. And uh, now we're having to go in and eradicate them. And you could see from that picture in the bottom left is um, they get huge. So they get 14, 15 feet long. A famous case of an invasive species becoming a problem is a brown tree snake. This was introduced into Guam during World War II. This is uh, a Pacific Island. It's caused the extinction of at least five species of birds. And uh, it is exceedingly good at climbing up trees. Uh, I've seen video of this species crossing uh, electric lines and phone lines. So you can have a, a tree all by itself. You can protect the tree. And uh, if there's a phone line running to that tree or through the tree, it'll, it'll use the phone line to get to the tree and drop off. It's, they're exceedingly good at climbing and uh, getting into bird's nests. And if you go to uh, places like Hawaii, the airport now has dogs that are trained to find brown tree snakes. So they regularly patrol the airports. And uh, I remember a story of a um, metal recycling ship that went to Guam and the US still has an army base there. And uh, they were picking up washers and dryers for recycling and bringing it back to Texas. And the voyage was three months long and when they got back to Texas, there was a uh, brown tree snake and alive, uh, apparently living in one of the washers. So they are exceedingly good at getting around. Right now, they're only on uh, Guam, introduced in the Guam. I mean, one or two islands, and thankfully that's about it. But they've already caused some extinctions. Uh, not just in the terrestrial habitat are invasives a problem. They're actually in invasive fish. So I already went over the snakehead <coughs> in the Mid-Atlantic. 
in the marine environment, you have things like the lionfish, which has been introduced into the Caribbean and the coral reefs. And this species is extremely prolific and it eats uh, many small fish and uh, they've shown that the lionfish will actually decrease species richness around coral reefs. And so <clears throat> when I went to Belize, and uh, I highly suggest you do, so here's a, a picture I took from Holchon Marine Reserve in Belize. Uh, the locals do not like this fish because the coral reef um, loses the diversity. And so it's not as attractive, right? It's not as interesting for them. It's not as interesting for tourists. So this is actually species you can hunt on the marine reserve. And if you go online, you can actually find restaurants that specialize in uh, this fish, in the lionfish. And in fact, the species is now moving up the Atlantic and there are American restaurants that specialize in uh, not just the lionfish, but invasive species, which is, I think, a brilliant idea. And I thought about one last one to talk about is fire ants. So fire ants are, are tiny and they burn, but they're also voracious nest predators. So I've had, uh, when I was doing my bluebird study in Georgia, uh, a few times I had in fire ants invade the uh, boxes and it was just terrible. All right. So invasive species, they can be predators and they can be herbivores. So um, a recent one is the emerald ash borer. In fact, the Wilkes University campus had to cut down, I think it was over 20 ash trees. It was every single ash tree on campus. Uh, there was about seven trees on Northampton. They're all gone. There was a really beautiful ash tree and there was a few of them, uh, large ash trees in front of uh, Wekaser in the library. And those are all gone because of this species. And uh, if you walk through the woods and just see a random dead tree, it's very likely to be uh, an ash tree that was killed by the ash borer. And you'll see uh, they're advertising that you should not move firewood. It's because the, the wood has this, um, the beetle in it. So what happens is the, the, the beetle drills a hole and then the grub, what it does is it gets below the bark into the cambium and the vascular tissue and then eats around the vascular tissue and essentially kills the tree because the tree can no longer transport water up or it sugars down. Japanese beetles are invasive. There's a, there's a picture there. Uh, the spotter lantern fly is another a uh, recent addition to our fauna. And uh, so that's a picture from uh, a plant nursery outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania. And right now this species is restricted to, it looks like Route 80, so south of Route 80. Uh, they're present, but they haven't made their way north of Route 80. And this is a hemipteran, so they have piercing mouth parts. So the emerald ash borer and the Japanese beetles are both coleopterans. Spotted lanternfly is a hemipteran. And so what they do is they use their piercing mouth part to um, get into the tree or vine or plant and then suck out the, uh, the sugars from the uh, phloem. So the spotted lanternflies is hitting vineyards um, very heavily right now. Asian longhorn beetles infect trees and kill many street trees and some native trees. Uh, Drosophila, that should sound familiar to you if you've taken genetics. Drosophila suzuki is a species of fruit fly. And this species, um, I don't know if you're familiar with fruit flies. So if you have a banana and you leave it out, it starts to rot. Uh, it'll get fruit flies, or if you leave tomatoes out too long, it'll get fruit flies. What this species does is it actually gets into fruit that is ripe. 
And the difference being is a lot of uh, fruit that's ripe or just before it ripens has a thick skin, okay? This species has a, a cutting mouth part that actually cuts into that tough skin, it lays its eggs in and will actually ruin fruit. So uh, where they have colonized in uh, Northwestern and Western Pennsylvania, they form clouds and in their wake, they leave behind uh, ruined blueberries, raspberry and other berry plants. And um, I saw a talk that followed bird populations. And when this species moves in, all the frugivorous species drop because there's no fruit to eat. So it's, it's really unfortunate. Uh, the woolly adelgid is a species that infects and kills, I should say, and can kill uh, hemlock. And in fact, there's uh, large patches of where hemlock has been killed. And so it actually, even though the species might be a millimeter to uh, large, it actually can kill huge swaths of hemlocks in our state. It's our state tree. So uh, there are species whose uh, major impact is that they modify the habitat that they're in. So nutria are, well, they are found in the very south central uh, Pennsylvania, but much more common in the southeast. In fact, if you go to Louisiana, you're almost guaranteed to see one if you do a, like a marsh tour. It's a very large rodent. Uh, when they face you, you just see these large iron teeth like a beaver. And uh, they modify their habitat because what they'll do is they'll just eat um, aquatic vegetation and they'll pull it up. And I worked on some projects when I was working for the state of Louisiana where we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in coastal restoration uh, planting plants and this species would come along and eat um, entire projects up. And uh, when that happens, you don't have plants holding the soil and so you'll get coastal erosion. So this species is uh, at least partially responsible for wetland loss in Louisiana. And um, I don't know how true it is, but they also form burrows and they burrowed into the levees um, in Louisiana. And again, I, I can't verify this, but uh, my understanding is that they weakened the levees and allowed the levees to bust during Katrina. All right, pigs. Um, so pigs are, um, major habitat modifiers because of their rooting. And what they do is they go along with their snouts and they push soil up and they're looking for um, soil uh, fungi, uh, buried acorns, they love acorns. And um, so this map on the uh, right is where you find uh, feral hogs. So I say pigs, it's feral hogs, and you can see they're found throughout the Southeast and the West, okay? Gypsy moths are, um, they're an herbivore as we went over before, but I put them as modifiers of habitat because their caterpillars are so voracious that they will open up a canopy and kill trees. So, my understanding is that if an oak is hit by gypsy moth two, three years in a row, it can kill the oak. And so we have a transformation of uh, forest trees from uh, susceptible oaks to more tolerant uh, red maple. And that is affecting our timber industry. But not only that, when you kill the canopy, uh, you allow light to come to the ground layer. And so our forests are also becoming more shrubby. <clears throat> for aquatic habitat in Pennsylvania, 
uh, there's something called rock snot. It's a very different type of, I don't know if it's a protozoan, it's not algae, it's not a unicellular protist, it's something in between. And it's called rock snot because it uh, covers uh, rocks in this sort of uh, gooey snot and uh, it ruins streams. Okay. Invasive species can outcompete our native species. So competitive displacement is where you have a similar species doing the same thing but the invasive species kicks out the native species. Um, one of our most endangered type of animal in the state is the freshwater, the different types of freshwater mussels. There are several freshwater mussel species in Pennsylvania and throughout the, the uh, East Coast that are endangered. And what happens is this little zebra mussel thing uh, covers it, it needs an anchor so it can't mat, nest in the mud or live in the mud. Our larger freshwater mussels can live in places like the mud, but the zebra mussels will, will cover and infest the uh, native mussel species and kill it. All right. So zebra mussels are bad news. Uh, these also clog uh, water intake places from the Great Lakes. And so they have to send... Uh, divers down to clean up the pipes and get rid of them. Um, so the species, the bird in the box is a, that's a male house sparrow. And these will kick out other birds. So anything that's their size or smaller, uh, they'll kick out or kill. So uh, I did a tree swallow study and this is a, um, Unfortunately, this is a uh, tree swallow that a male house sparrow killed by pecking it in the back of the head. It's really, really, really terrible. And in fact, one male um, went to three or four boxes and killed the tree swallows in each one of the boxes. So it was a, it was a bad week for me. Okay, invasive plants can be poor food sources. And uh, the two that come to mind are Lanicera on the left and Buckthorn on the right. And I'm not so sure about Lanicera. So there's native Lanicera and there's some uh, native Buckthorn, which is the genus Ramus. Uh, but I do know that Buckthorn, uh, this looks like a good fruit. So this is the plant on the right. So the anthocyanins give it that, that blue color. That's a strong antioxidant. But what a bird is expecting when it eats a fruit is uh, some sugars and some lipids. And this species is low in both of those and contains a diuretic. So it actually uh, causes the bird to have diarrhea. And um, since it doesn't have a lot of nutrients, this is not a plant that um, birds do well on by eating this as a primary food source. Invasive species can be diseases themselves or disease vectors. So some introduced diseases, we have chestnut blight that wiped out the chestnuts. We still have chestnuts in Pennsylvania instead of them being say, uh, three foot diameter trees that are 75, 100 feet tall. There are chestnuts now get about uh, four or five inches in diameter and then they uh, are killed by the chestnut blight, which is a fungus um, that invades the xylem phloem and, and kills the chestnut. Um, West Nile virus was introduced into the US and um, it's gone in a few waves. I know of two waves since 1999 when it was introduced. And um, this species kills crows, but it also kills birds of prey uh, pretty quickly. Dutch elm disease is another fungus. And uh, 
this one has really wiped out a number of uh, elms. And fortunately, uh, our elms do live with Dutch elm disease, but they uh, do not become as, as large. So elm trees are these beautiful, they have a, a just a fantastic sort of base shape to them. And uh, they used to be the primary street tree in the US until Dutch elm disease. Um, I have a number on my street and they get about a foot in diameter and then they're killed. And so there's a number of young elm trees and they'll get so big and then killed and so on. So we just don't have the, uh, if you could imagine if you were to go back 150 years ago, our forest would be filled with these uh, really large chestnut trees and elm trees. And it must have been a, a really an interesting place to be. So those are the invasive diseases. There's many, many more. I'm just giving you three. And then you have introduced disease vectors. So uh, these uh, insects may not cause uh, problems themselves, but they can carry diseases. So both the Asian tiger mosquitoes and mosquitoes in the genus Aedes uh, carry um, West Nile, as well as Eastern equine encephalitis and a number of other um, viruses that are harmful to wildlife. Okay, and these have been introduced. Uh, an upside to invasive species. Um, a few papers have come out recently to say like um, our attitudes, uh, we may have to change because many invasive species are here to stay. And so an example would be some flowers in an urban setting might be the only uh, pollen and nectar resources for invertebrates. Um, and they've shown where you have lots of invasive shrubs that uh, bird diversity is a little bit higher. Okay. So this, and it's because they think birds have a place to nest and there's a fruit resource. Okay. Um, and it can be prey, prey items. So uh, there's a number of urban hawks, right? Red tail hawks. Peregrine falcons, Cooper's hawks. These are urban birds of prey and they prey on house sparrows and pigeons. Okay, so there is sort of an upside to invasive species. I just want you to keep in mind that um, invasive species are the second most common reason why uh, species are endangered and also that the monetary costs, the $120 billion a year, a year uh, was somewhere from 2005, and it's probably closer and above $150 billion a year. Solutions, there's been a um, few examples where we've been able to sort of uh, put the genie back in the bottle, as they say. Some of those would be large mammals on islands. So the Galapagos had a huge goat problem. Uh, and goats themselves, not a big deal, except they eat everything. And large parts of the Galapagos were, were um, they don't have a, the Galapagos Island doesn't have a forest per se. It's very shrubby, desert-like, uh, but they were moving the vegetation that was really important for the bird life there. <clears throat> so they removed the goats and a few other places they've removed rats. Um, it takes a lot of work. You can only do it on islands. Okay. And then some of these um, control strategies have actually made it worse. So Hawaii has a rat problem and they released mongoose to eat the rats. Keep in mind that the rats were eating uh, ground nesting birds and their eggs. And one hope was is that the mongoose would eat the rats and save the birds. 
but uh, the mongoose found the birds as delicious as the rats did. So it actually made things worse. So you can go to Hawaii and they have invasive mongoose there. There's several species of mongoose. There's not just one mongoose, there's several species. And uh, I know there's at least one invasive mongoose in Hawaii now. <laughs> okay, so since control is, is really tough, uh, prevention is key. So there's uh, thankfully APHIS, right? That's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service does a great job inspecting, okay? So when uh, you fly through uh, a major airport, you may have your uh, bag sniffed by an animal. They also randomly look at imports. Um, I have a friend of mine that works for the EPA and she's trying to develop some uh, image recognition software where you can scan in rice and then look for invasive insects that way. Um, because we import tons and tons, literally tons and tons of food. Uh, and with that food, you can bring in invasive insects. The Lacey Act prevents you from bringing in what is considered injurious wildlife. So you can't just go to um, Africa, grab a bunch of zebras, and let them loose in the prairie. Okay, so there are some laws. Uh, one is the Alien Species Prevention Enforcement Act, which is an amendment to the Lacey Act of 1992. And that keeps you from mailing uh, plants and the Plant Protection Act of 2000 um, is in addition to this that you just can't uh, buy plants on the internet, although you probably can and just mail them around. Um, although it made the news, I don't know if you remember that people were getting these packets from China and they were often filled with seeds. So it still happens. Um, there are some laws to uh, reduce the impact of ballast. Okay that you have to treat your ballast a certain way before you dump out all those critters. And despite all this, I wanted to bring up the fact that still invasives are increasing. Yeah. So it's something that we should be concerned about. And um, I teach conservation biology every year, every other year, and every other year I have to update this chapter. The costs are increasing. Um, when I got this job in 2007, Emerald Ashbor was just getting on the scene. And uh, we just took out those oaks, maybe, th I mean, those uh, ash trees, maybe three years ago. And um, stink bugs were not a thing, right? When I first got here, stink bugs were becoming uh, an issue. So when I teach this in two years, oh yeah, spotter lantern fly, there's a new one. So every time I give this lecture, there's a new invasive species to talk about, okay? All right, sorry for the uh, downer of a lecture, but it is super important to be aware of uh, the things that are going on out there. All right, thanks. If you have any questions, please send me an email.